Welcome guys uh, to the ECG practical approach. So we are going to run through a handful of series, then you do the quizzes, then we'll review, and hopefully you never run away again from an ECG ever again, okay? ECG is one of the most easiest thing to interpret if you just put in the time. So with this series, hopefully by the time you finish this series, I'm telling you, you should have confidence to say, no doctor, I may not know this, but I know how, how to interpret an ECG, okay? The approach is always the same, okay? You start with demographics, very important. Then you move to calibration, then the rate, then the rhythm, then the axis, then the individual waves, and then the rest of the other things that you may look for in an ECG. So running through demographics very quickly. The first thing you are going to have to make sure the patient has a name because it helps with identification, okay? Then the age, why is the age important? We know that any age above 40, some say 50, is a serious cardiovascular risk factor for coronary artery diseases, okay? Sex is particularly also important. We know male is a cardiovascular risk factor, but we also know females are prone to certain cardiovascular cardiorespiratory conditions such as pulmonary embolism, which may have a manifestation on an ECG, okay? Time is one of the most important things when you are talking about ECG and myocardial infarction because you have a very narrow window for thrombolysis or if you are even taking the patient to a cath lab for a PCI. Very, very important. And finally, the race, okay? We do know that black people are more prone to coronary artery disease, probably even Asians more. We do know also that uh, Caucasians are prone to other cardiovascular illnesses, and so that helps you kind of map yourself what you expect in that patient. Now, we are done with demographics. Then we move on to calibration, okay? Calibration, think about calibration. I always say that it's the unit, Okay, you see how weight, you have units of grams, kgs, and tons. The ECG is also having a unit, and we call it calibration, okay? It's basically the unit of how we measure our ECGs, okay? And as with all things, just like weight, there's kg, tons, and what, there is also different calibrations for ECG. However, what we're going to focus on is what is universally accepted, and that's what we call standard calibration, okay? Now, standard calibration, there are actually a number of ways that you can uh, uh, to figure it out if it's standard. Now, number one is by just looking, okay, at the number of boxes, okay? Standard calibration dictates that the, you see this, what starts, if you have ever wanted this box that comes, then the ECG starts, this is where we look for calibration, okay? The moment you have two big boxes, the height of two big boxes, that is standard calibration, okay? So if you see one, two, three, four, five, so up to here is one big box, then one, two, three, four, five, up to there is the second big box. And so that shows me that it's standard calibrated. I don't need to move uh, anywhere. Another way you can establish is if by looking at the speed of the ECG, okay? How fast is the paper being printed, okay? And the moment you see 25 millimeters per second, this, ladies and gentlemen, is standard calibration, okay? 25 millimeters per second is standard calibration. Okay? And finally, you can look at the power, the millivolt of it writing on the paper. Okay? The moment you have 10 millimeters, so for every 10 millimeter, there is a power of 1 millivolt given. Okay? Typically, um, you will see it uh, on an ECG, either up or down. So these are just things. But the moment you see either of these, you look, it's two high, high, small, big boxes, or the speed of 25 or 10 millimeter per millivolt, you know it's standard calibrated, and you know your interpretation will be very good, okay? And I also just want to highlight that, remember the small box is like that, it's one millimeter by one millimeter, okay? And so, one millimeter is equal to one small box, which is also equal to 0 0.04 seconds. This is just basics that you need to know. Then a large big box, remember, has um, five small boxes, and remember one small box is one millimeter, so it's five millimeters. So one large box is equal to point.
And so, in the end, if you are with a consultant, you say, my brother, can you please interpret this ECG? You see, the very first thing, so that you don't confuse yourself, you just say, this is an ECG of 27-year-old Mr. Ishaka. It was taken on the 2nd of February 2020 at 16.30 with standard calibration. I'm telling you, if you can start the ECG like that, you have already bought, bought yourself time to think what the hell I'm supposed to look on for it, okay? So it's in there. We've already mentioned the age, the name of the patient, the date, the time, and that it's standard calibrated. Everyone understand what we're talking about. All right. Now, moving on to, remember, so we did calibration. Then now we need to do the rate. Okay. So how do we establish rate on an ECG? All right. So always remember that there are two methods. There is a shortcut. Okay. Then there is a long cut. Okay. Or a long method. All right. Shortcut is only the, the, the prerequisite that it, there should be a regular rhythm. Okay. You can only use it if the rhythm is regular. Okay, which means from the R to the R, it should be the same from this R to this R. Okay, that's the regularity. You can't be doing it in irregular rhythms. Otherwise, it will not be accurate. Okay, so the short method as it is, it's very fast, but it's not the most accurate. Okay, so the short method dictates that you take 300, you divide it by the R to R. Are we together? So by counting the number of big boxes. Okay, and typically we want to do it to the nearest decimal. Okay, let's take a look at an example. Okay, this is a Q, that's an R, that's an S, right? So it's, they said R to R. So it's from this R to the next R, that's the next R. Okay, so we count the number of big boxes between this R and the next R. Okay, we know we have one, we have two, we have three, we have four, we have five. Okay, but then this one is cut. If you see, it has many boxes, one, two, three, four. And again, this is cut with one. That makes up an additional, this area and this area will form the sixth box. Okay, and that's typically what they mean to the nearest decimal. Example for here, let's come here. The fifth, we ended in the fifth. So in the sixth box, it didn't fully come all the way. So we say 5.2, 5.4, 5.6, 5.8. Okay. And remember here, there was a one, uh, a, a point two here. And so it makes up six. And so you say 300 divided by six is equal to 50 bits per minute. And you can see how fast it is, okay? You need to practice uh, here and there, but it's a very short method and it works all the time. All right, now, when given uh, to a full ECG, you typically want to do use the long method, okay? So the long method, as it implies, it takes a bit of time, but it's highly accurate, okay? So what you do, the first step in the long method, remember, uh, I just want to mention that whenever you are calculating rate and looking at the rhythm, you always look at the rhythm strip, what we call the rhythm strip. Each ECG, every ECG that you get at the bottom here, they will always have an elongated lead, which is lead 2 actually. Lead 2, it's an elongated format, which we call a rhythm strip. Okay, now the long method dictates that you count 30 big boxes. Okay, now let's count. Okay, so we want to start here at the beginning of the QRS complexes. So we sort 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, up to here is 30. Okay, so we have counted 30 big boxes. Okay, then the second thing that you want to do is count the number of QRS complexes in those 30 seconds, 30 boxes. Okay, so between here and here, how many QRS complexes do we have? We have one, we have two, we have three, we have four, we have five, we have six, we have seven, okay? Then that number, you multiply it by 10, and then you get 70 bits per minute, okay? You can pause this and repeat it. This is a very simple, long method, okay? It's useful, especially if the rate is irregular, okay? But you can use it whether it's regular or irregular, but the shortcut, you can only use it if the rhythm 
is regular. Okay. Happiness, I think uh, we definitely have happiness there. We have talked about calibration. We have talked about the rate. Now we'll talk about quickly the rhythm. All right. Now, speaking about rhythm, what you need to understand is that typically, of course, if you're examining a patient, you want to know, is it regular? Is it irregular? Irregular? Is it irregular? Because there are a host of differentials for that. But with an ECG, that's not always the case. We, what we really want for the ECG is to dictate if, well, this is useful. It is useful, definitely. But what I want to focus on, people want to hear, is it sinus rhythm or non-sinus? And we hear it a lot in things like Grace Anatomy. Is it sinus rhythm or no, is it non-sinus or is it AFib or is it what? Okay, so you want to establish. Now, what does sinus rhythm dictate? So we look at the heart, okay? That's the right atrium, that's the left atrium, that's the left ventricle, that's the right ventricle, okay? Remember, electrical potential starts where? It starts in a node called the SA node, okay? Then it jumps to the second node, which is called the AV node, to delay conduction. Then it goes down, all right? Now, if the rhythm is sinus it means sinus comes from SA node it means the rhythm is originating from an SA node all right do you understand the moment the rhythm is originating from the SA node it's called sinus it's typically very regular very well paced okay as opposed to a condition like AFib AFib what in generality simply means that there are multiple foci in the right atrium or the left atrium acting like SA nodes, and everyone is just firing wherever they want, okay? And whenever that happens, that's why in AFib, everyone is just firing as if they are the SA node. And that's why in AFib, you never see a P wave, okay? Because a P wave indicates that there's a common formality coming from the SA nodes moving down, okay? That's why AFib is non-sinus, okay? Now, what are the characteristics that the rhythm has to be categorized for it to be? sinus there has to be p waves but they have to be correct correctly oriented okay which means number one they have to precede qrs complexes absolutely but the correctly oriented we mean the normal morphology it has to be a nice round smooth smooth you see the p wave should be smooth it should not be that okay so it should be nice round smooth round Upright, very, very important in orientation. It has to be upright and it should have regular rhythm and there has to be a normal PR interval, okay? There are exceptions though. A P wave is always positive, which means it's upright, except in only two leads, particularly AVR, which you will see that it's a lot of exception in a lot of things because it's the inverse lead and so things will always be the inverse. And so in AVR, you expect it to be downward, otherwise it's abnormal, okay? And finally, it's normally what we call biphasic in V1, okay? Which means the up and the down, they are the same, okay? Can you see there? It maintains that almost S-like shape, what you call a biphasic waveform. Otherwise, in the exception of these two leads, a P wave has to be upright, round, smooth, regular, and with a normal PR interval.